All right. Good morning, everybody. It is good to be here. And uh, my name is Dave Ferguson. I'm the lead pastor here at Community, which just means that I have the privilege of overseeing all, all 13 of our locations across the Chicagoland area. And it is. I mean, it is, it is the best job in the whole wide world. And I'm sorry, you can't have it. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. Mo- most of the time, I think most of the time, and see if you agree with this, we just kind of feel like we're, 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 we're going through life. You know, we just kind of feel like we're going through life. But then there are those moments, those moments when you can kind of feel the life kind of going through you. Um, I was trying to think about a few of these. I remember I was, I was, I was in seventh grade. I was in seventh, seventh grade basketball tryouts, Deer Creek Junior High. And they were going to announce who was going to make the basketball team by posting the names of all 12 team members on the, on the back of that metal gym door. My NBA career was hanging in the balance. And I remember by the time I got there, there was already a crowd of boys, right? Already a crowd of boys. They're all huddled around the gym door. And I was trying to see the names on the list, trying to poke my you know, head in there. And then one of the guys turned to me and he said, you made the team. And in that moment, I could feel the life, right, flowing through me. I remember um, uh, it was the first real date, first real date with, uh, with my wife, Sue. We were at Aurelio's Pizza. You know Aurelio's? I think, I think it's the best thin crust in Chicago. Down in Homewood, Illinois, the, 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 kind of I call it the mothership. That was the very first store down there. And uh, it was on that night that I could see that we had a future together. I don't know if she saw it, but I could see it. <laughs> and I could feel the life, right, flowing through me. It was February 6, 1988. It was the coldest day, actually the coldest day of that whole year. Oh, it was brutally cold. But it was also our wedding day. We had so many friends and family because my dad was a pastor, part of a large church. So we would invite. We actually had two receptions. We had two wedding receptions, and we had this party. And I would still to this day, and I think Sue probably, I would still to this day say it was the best party that I've ever ever been to. Everybody was singing. Everybody was on the dance floor. Everybody was having just a great time. And it was one of those kind of this experience. I mean, you could feel the life just kind of flowing through everybody. July twenty fourth. After a scare with both mom and baby. Over at Good Samaritan Hospital, we gave birth, to our, gave birth to our firstborn, Amy. And I got to go out in the lobby and tell my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister, hey, we got a little girl. And you could feel the life, right, flowing through me. March 5th, about 26 years ago, Naperville Central High School in the cafeteria. For some reason, by God's providence, 465 people showed up and it gave birth to a dream that we could be a church that would help people find their way back to God. And I could feel the life kind of flowing through me. October 26, 2005. And only one baseball team from Chicago would ever be in a World Series in this century. (laughs) And they won it in four straight games. I figure it's almost April, so we got to start this whole baseball thing, right? But here's, here's, the, here's the point. The point is, I think there are, there are, there are those moments in time when you kind of like you feel fully alive, right? And we love those moments. We wish there was some way, how can we, how can we actually live in those moments? And I want you to hear this phrase. Like, I'm going to call those Zoe moments. Say that for me, Zoe moments. Zoe. And what we're doing today, we're actually wrapping up a series. And this has been, I mean, this has been an incredible series where we've talked about five different awakenings that can help us find our way back to God. And one of the things I want you to get about these awakenings Please, please, please hang on to this. These awakenings will help you find your way back to God for the first time, but they will also, if you will implement them on a regular basis, help you stay close to God time and time and time again. Awakening number one, we said this is awakening to longing, where what we discover is that every one of us, we have this longing for love, to love and to be loved. Man, we want that. We have a longing for purpose, a longing to make sense out of life when it doesn't make sense. And this first awakening is when we discover that those longings were actually placed inside of us by God to keep us close to God. But the second awakening that often happens is the awakening to regret. When we realize that we've tried to fulfill those longings on our own without God, right? We all do it. We have these longings to try to fulfill them without God, and then we end up with regret. Longings we try to fulfill without God, we end up with regret. 
And we do this over and over and over again, and we call that the sorry cycle, longing regret, longing regret. Some people do it for months. Some people do it for years. Some people go their whole life. But we finally get to the place where we're going like, you know what? I can't just keep doing this longing regret thing anymore. I need help. That's awakening number three. I can't do this on my own. I need help, and help has a name. And his name is what? His name is Jesus. That leads us to awakening number four, because we begin to follow Jesus. What Jesus does is he leads us back to God, and we have this awakening to love that God loves me. God loves me after all. He loves me after all. And it's when we actually come into a relationship with God that we realize our real identity, and our real identity is this, that we are this profoundly loved, unconditionally loved child of God. Well, today's the fifth awakening. And the fifth awakening is what we're calling awakening to life. Awakening to life, those Zoe moments. I don't know about you, but I think if you were here last Sunday, and if you weren't, I, I, I feel sorry for you, uh, but I think we got to experience a taste of that life last Sunday as we celebrated. Um, we had um, a record number here. We had 131 people here at the Yellow Box that were baptized last Sunday. It was just awesome. If you were here, it was an awesome weekend. Actually, <clears throat> and across all of our community campuses, we had 215 people that were baptized. And uh, yes, absolutely. And just to kind of give you a taste of what it was like last week uh, and across all of our locations, here are 200 plus of those people who found their way back to God. There was a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, father I want right now what's coming to me. So, so he divided his property between them. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And Where there he waste wasted all his money in wild living. He had spent everything. When a bad famine spread through that whole land, soon he had nothing he to eat. He was hungry and needed money, so he went and got a job with one of the people who lived there. The man sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He would have been glad to eat what the pigs were eating, but no one gave him a thing. Finally, when he, he came, came to, to his, his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But let me be like one of your hired workers. So he left and he went to his father. While the son was still a long way While off, his he father was saw still him. a long way off. He felt sorry for him. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. So he ran to threw him, his and arms him, around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and have done wrong to you. I am no longer I don't worthy deserve to be called your, your son. son ever again. But the father said to his but servants. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the best calf and prepare it. Bring the so fat calf and, and celebrate. Kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but has now come back to life. son of mine was dead life. and has returned to life. He was lost and is found. He was lost so the party and is began. found. Given up for lost so and they now began found. to celebrate. And they began to have a wonderful time. Woo. I'll tell you what, baptism, if you haven't picked up on it, by God's design is this beautiful symbol of, of death, okay, a burial of death, and then you come back to life. And you, and you can see it. I mean, you saw it last week, and you see it. You can see the life on people's faces. And you can see the, I mean, I can see the life on all of our faces as we were watching this. And I don't know if you caught one of them, but one of, one of those little, little cubes there, it's just this great moment. It was actually at our Lincoln Square campus. A young man, probably in early, early 20s, was baptized. And as soon as he came, went down into the water, came back up, it was just like the story of the prodigal son. His dad was sitting out in, this, out in the crowd. And his dad gets up and almost like runs down the aisle to where the baptistry is. And he, and he grabs him and hugs him and then grabs his face and kisses him on the forehead. That was a moment. That's a moment. That is a moment, a Zoe moment. But those are normally going to just, just moments. And the rest of life, and we don't feel very alive. It can feel very far from that. So most of the time, it kind of feels like we're just kind of going through life, and it doesn't feel like life is actually going through us. So today, what we want to do is I just want to address kind of this last in the series, it's kind of this ultimate question. How do we fully awaken to life? 
And the prayer of the fifth awakening is this. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me a confidence that I can live a brand new life. And see, here's the deal. Jesus came when he said, here's the reason I came. Please hear this. He said, I came so that, to give you life and life to its fullest. Now, the original language in the New Testament, there's actually two different words for life. One of the words is this word bios. Say that for me, bios. That's one of the words in the New Testament for life, bios. It's the root word for biology, right? Bios means kind of a natural life. It means kind of a chronological life. It means kind of like going through life, right? The average bios life includes 250,000 hours of sleep. It includes 76,000 meals, 200,000 trips to the bathroom, right? We call it a bio break, right? That's a part of a bios life. There's a second word for life in the New Testament, and it's this word. Say this after me, Zoe. Zoe. Now, Zoe actually includes bios, but then it goes way beyond that. If bios is about quantity and kind of more of the same, Zoe's about quality, a quality of life that only comes from knowing God. And actually, when they use the word Zoe life, it means eternal life which doesn't just mean going on forever, but it means a qualitatively different kind of life. Not just the life that you're going through, but life is actually going through you. And when Jesus says, I have come, and he's talking to you specifically, I have come that you may have life, and I want you to have life to the full. Guess which term, guess which word for life he's using? Zoe. That's exactly right, Zoe. Zoe. He's talking about a kind of quality of life that actually it has, it has like a, a, a <clears throat> it kind of transcends a time-space continuum. It actually can change your past. It actually changes your present. It actually can change your future, this Zoe kind of life when you find your way back to God. What's fascinating, as I studied the story of the prodigal son and working on the book, I mean, Jesus intentionally uses the language even in this story to make a point. At one point, after the son comes to the father, he, the son requests his part of the inheritance. He says, I want my share of the property. And it says this. It says, the father divided his property between them. Now, the word that actually that is used in the story there, property, is the same word. It's bios. And so literally, the father, when he gives him all his share of the inheritance, his stuff, the father kinda, is literally kind of saying, okay, I'll let you have all the bios, Right? He kind of divides up his, his life or his livelihood. I'll let you have all the bios you want, but someday you're going to realize there's more than just same old, same old. This is not going to fully satisfy because this pales in comparison to Zoe life, life with the Father. I think the question for us this morning is this. How do we experience that Zoe life? What kind of rhythms, what kind of structures do we put into place to make sure that it's not just more of the same old, same old kind of bios life, like we're going through life, but how do I feel like life's really actually going through me? And what I want to give you, I want to give you three experiences. And, and from my own experience over the last 25 years as, as a pastor here and, and following Jesus, I'm telling you, center your life around these three experiences. Center your life around these three critical experiences. And I'm going to give you the first one in just a second, but I want to back up. Right before Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, he tells two other stories. He tells stories about people who lose things of great value. First story, maybe you'll remember this. It's about a man who had 100 sheep. He loses one of them. He looks and looks and looks and looks and looks and looks for it. He finally finds it, and it says this. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. That's the first story. Second story. Second story is about a woman who loses a valuable coin. She looks and looks and looks and looks for it, and when she finally finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. Then we get to our story, the story of the prodigal son. As we've already seen, when the son finally gets home, right, almost on his way home, the father runs, right, to embrace him. And as he embraces him, he makes his announcement. He says this, he says, let's have a feast, let's celebrate. This son of mine was dead and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found, and so they all began to celebrate. I hope you notice something here. It happens in every story. When the lost sheep is found, it happens. When the lost coin is found, it happens. When the lost son is found, it happens. What happens? They celebrate. That's exactly right. They celebrate. Everybody comes together for a party. And I love the last story because what happens is like everybody's invited to a great party at the father's house. Isn't that right? 
They get invited to a great party at the Father's house. I'm telling you this, if you want to experience Zoe kind of life, not just go through life, but have life feel like it's going through you, you are invited, okay, to a party at the Father's house. Hear me on this. That's what this is, okay? Maybe you've mistaken this for a church service, <laughs> okay, which I have to go to, which is boring, right, or that kind of thing. I'm telling you, no, what this is, this is a party at the Father's house. That's why we call it a celebration service. And here's what happens. When we get it right, here's what happens in this place. We celebrate all that God's done in the past, all that God's doing right now, and what we anticipate He's going to do in the future. We teach about that. We tell stories about that. I'm telling you, I am so grateful for the people who had the courage and that we've created a safe place here for people to tell their full stories, like on the screen. Are you with me? It has been awesome during this series. So encouraging. But not only that, you know, we do this other thing. We, we sing. Why do we sing? That's weird, isn't it? I mean, where else do you? Well, what's interesting, if you actually look at the Bible, over and over again, when God intervenes in people's life, you know what the response was? They would sing. They would party. They'd have, they'd have a party. About like when God parted the waters and the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, it says when they got to the other side, the people sang a song of deliverance. When Mary found out that she was going to give birth to this baby named Jesus, she sings the Magnificat, right? She sings. And so we sing. This is a party. And kind of like I referred to, when Sue and I, at our wedding, I mean, it was. It was just this great party. Everybody, everybody all the old people, everybody was on the dance floor dancing, you know, singing along to Cool in the Gang or something. I don't know. But that's what happens. A good party, right? Everybody participates. Everybody's in on it. Everybody's singing. Everybody's dancing. And I'm telling you, if you want to have a Zoe life, not just go through life, but life go through you, you need to. And this is not me trying to bang the hammer about getting people to come to church. We got record attendance, okay? So we're doing fine. But here's what you need if you want to live a life to the fullest. You need to say, you know what? I got to always show up at the Father's house when he's having a party because I need that. That's the first experience of celebrating. All right? Let me tell you about the second experience. You got to center your life around. A while back, a researcher named Edward Hollowell, he did some research with the Harvard Medical School. He discovered two of the most powerful and meaningful experiences in all of life, kind of Zoe moments, are what he called achieving and connecting. Achieving, reaching a goal, accomplishing something worthwhile. I get that. Connecting, relating to somebody in a very significant, lasting kind of way. Hallowell, okay, this Harvard, his, 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 what his observation was is that our society is becoming more and more obsessed with achieving while at the same time becoming more and more inept at connecting. And of course, achieving is not bad, not at all. But as research showed that people who excel at achieving but fail to connect end up as unhappy people. They go through life, but there's no life going through them. Hear that, okay? There's a lot of us in this room. By contrast, he said, their observation, the research showed that people who prioritize connecting in meaningful relationships, even if they weren't great at achieving and accomplishing goals, they still reported a more fulfilled life, life going through them. All right, I mean, that's not, I mean, we didn't actually have to go to Harvard to get that, did we? But I kind of did that because that way you kind of pay attention. I mean, that's common sense. You cannot experience this kind of Zoe life that God wants you to without it. When we connect in a meaningful way with other people who found their way back to God, here's what we discover. We discover that we are better together than we are on our own. Turn to somebody next to you and say, I am better together than I am on my own. All right? Turn to somebody next to you and say that. There you go. That's right. Don't forget that. On Tuesday in this room, um, I did uh, Steve Cambroni's funeral. And uh, some of you know Steve. You've been greeted by Steve probably at the doors here. And uh, Steve is a guy who uh, experienced Zoe life. And if you talk to Steve, I mean, he, by his own admission, he was a man, and he would tell you the straight-out truth, great failures, and he'd also say great successes, and he'd tell you about both of them. <laughs> and that's why we love Steve, uh, just so authentic. But if you ask Steve when his life changed, he would tell you, he would point to a moment when he got in a small group. 
When he got in a small group, that's when he got sober. See, some of you are stuck in that sorry cycle. Longing regret, longing regret. That's when he got sober. That, when he got in a small group, that's when he found God. When he got in a small group, he was able to name his higher power, and he started to become a follower of Jesus. And it was people in a small group that baptized him. And what he discovered was a Zoe kind of life that gave him a better qualitative life. But you know what? Even though he died, we know that he has eternal life, Zoe kind of life. Hear me on this, okay? If you want to not just go through life, but you want to have life go through you, I am telling you, we are better together than we are on our own. And you need to find a way to get in a small group so you're doing life with other people. Three core experiences. I'm telling you, please hear me on this. The first one is to celebrate. The second one is to connect. And here's the third one. The third one is to contribute. God's great desire, God's great desire is that every one of us contribute to his dream, and that is that this, that every single person find their way back to God. Every single person finds their way back to God. And here's the thing, because we have found our way home, he wants us to help others find their way home too. Because he has risked loving us, he risked loving us. Then he asks us, I want you to risk loving other people. That's our mission. And I've, I've, I've thought about the, the, the son. You know, after the son came home to the father, I wonder how he changed after that if we kept the story going. What was he like after he'd come home and celebrated and had that party at the father's house? I have to believe, I doubt that he ever looked at a hungry man or woman the same again. I doubt he ever listened to somebody's story of failure with loss or judgment. I doubt he ever thought about his father's wealth as just kind of about buying him status and comfort. See, when we really awaken to this Zoe kind of life, all of a sudden we begin to see the possibilities for our future. We see them completely different. Our priorities change. Life becomes something bigger and, and better and more meaningful than ever before because we can be a part of this mission of helping other people find their way back to God. I, I want to uh, end this series uh, with a story about a guy... Who, uh, who's living a Zoe kind of life. And it's been a real inspiration to me. Um, I think we, there's Lane. Uh, Lane's a guy who, probably more than anybody else, kept telling me for the last probably, oh gosh, six, seven years, Dave, you've got to write a book, Finding Your Way Back to God. You need to write this book, Finding Your Way Back to God. It was just on my case all the time. It was not quite a decade ago that I sat in Lane's uh, living room and Lane was lying in a hospital bed that the hospice people had brought in to make him comfortable because they were saying this is going to be his last days on earth, almost a decade ago. And he had me come over and uh, to plan his funeral. He told me what he wanted, what he wanted to say, what we wanted sung, how we would celebrate it. And as I'm right, taking notes, I couldn't help think back just a few years before that when Lane found his way back to God. And Lane's one of those guys who, I mean, he's type A, driven personality, started his work day at 5 a.m., finished in the evening, and his hard work paid off. He was an executive in a, a large company. When he went to started with them, they were about a $100 million business. By the time he retired, they were over $9 billion business. But an illness that he had brought all that to a complete halt. And when he stopped long enough to reflect on his life, he began to realize, you know what? There's a whole lot of me that's just kind of going through life. And there's not enough life going through me. There's something missing. As a kid, his parents had taken him to church, and he had a real faith. But that faith had gradually become kind of faint and a forgotten memory. Does that feel familiar to any of you? And now he's sick. And it was the kind of sick that would slowly kill him. And in the meantime, would basically he'd be in pain about 16 hours out of the day. But this sickness was like a wake-up call, and he was grateful for it. I remember, I remember Lane told me, he said, you know, Dave, the best thing that ever happened to me was getting sick. From the time I got sick, it refocused me. It caused me to find my way back to God and feel close to God, and I'd give up everything I have now. Everything, I, I give up everything for what I have now. Um, fortunately, I still have not used those notes that I took for Lane's funeral. And Lane is still with us. Uh, but he hasn't been cured. And uh, he's a tough, tough, tough guy, and he struggles every day. But he sees his mission is this. He's a messenger. To share his story, 
to help others find their way back to God. And he does it every day, whether it's in person or via email, with coworkers from where he used to work with, he's still in relationship with, with family members, with friends, whoever God puts in his path. And uh, I asked Lane what he would say to you and me, and uh, here's his words. I know life is but a moment in God's eternity, and that's why it's important for us to take each day and make the most of it. Each of us has friends that are dealing with problems, whether it be divorce, financial problems, children's problems, you name it, they've got it. If we pray to God and ask Him to help us become messengers for Him by giving us the right words to say or write and reach out to people, we can help them find their way back to God. My plan is to do this every day for the rest of my life till the day I die. It's the most important thing. For years I thought I had things good, but I knew I was missing something, and that was the personal relationship with God. And once I found it, I knew it was important for me to share it with others and try to help them find their way back to God.